Hello, and welcome to the workshop, Helping Your Child Listen to and Follow Directions. I'm Dr. Barbara Kaminsky, Clinical Director of Greenbox ABA, and I will be your host for this workshop. Today we're going to talk about some of the difficulties you may be having getting your child to follow your directions. When you ask your child to do something and they don't follow through, we need to ask ourselves, is it possible that they can't follow through because they don't know what we've asked? Or is it the case that they won't follow through because they don't have the motivation? At the end of this workshop, you will have learned the steps in a process that has been shown to improve listening to and following directions while also decreasing challenging and oppositional behavior. Along the way, we'll also talk about some in the moment strategies and things we can do to help those situations in which our child can't follow the directions because they don't actually know what we're asking. I also need to acknowledge that the seven steps approach that's described as a part of this presentation is based on presentations given by Robert Schramm and on the book, The Seven Steps to Earning Instructional Control, which he wrote with Dr. Megan Miller. So what are we going to do today? Well, we're gonna start by defining the problem, run through some common ineffective solutions, and then we'll take those and instead of using those, look at some of the in the moment strategies that we can use. Many of those in the moment strategies focus on things that our child is having difficulty doing while we're asking them to follow directions. And then some of them start to touch on the question of what happens and what should we do when our child won't follow our instructions. We'll then go through a more comprehensive way of looking at changing that behavior through the seven steps approach. And we'll end with discussing some potential problems and solutions when trying the seven steps approach that has been discussed. All right, let's get started. Before we would begin talking about how to solve the problem, let's take a minute to just pause and jot down at least one example of a time recently when you asked your child to do something and they refused. What did you ask them to do? And what did they do instead? Take just a moment. Okay, now that you've thought about those, let's take a look at some of the common ineffective strategies that we might use to deal with a situation like that. What is the problem that we're trying to, do, to solve today? Well, we want to increase the likelihood that a child will follow the directions when they're given by a parent or another adult without those ineffective solutions, power struggles, physically forcing them to do it, or nagging and repeating the instruction. The first of those ineffective approaches that we want, I want to talk about today is the power struggle. This may involve blocking your child from leaving the area or waiting until they give in and do it or waiting until you give in and do it. I'd like to give you an example from my own life of a power struggle and a time when I didn't actually handle it very well. When my son was about uh, somewhere between two or three years old, he learned how to unbuckle the belt in his car seat. If you're thinking about that, you already realize that that's a huge problem. So we were leaving the store, a store one day, and he didn't want to leave. We got to the van, I took him and put him into the car seat, I buckled the car seat, and he unbuckled it. And I buckled it, and he unbuckled it. And I buckled it, and he unbuckled it. And we continued to have that power struggle for some time until literally I sat on the side of the van in the parking lot and I just wept. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't drive home because that wasn't safe and I sure wasn't about to give in and go back into the store. 
Eventually, what I did do, and I'm not sure that it was the correct solution, but it was the one I chose in the moment, was to close the van door, get in, and drive very carefully home with him unbuckled. We're going to look at some alternatives to that kind of a power struggle today. The second common ineffective approach that we might use is physically helping our child. In therapy, we use hand over hand prompting in order to help a child accomplish a task. That's okay when we're teaching our children to do things, but it's not a long-term solution when we are trying to get our children to follow our instructions and do the things that we've asked them to do. The last of the ineffective approaches that we might use is to nag, to repeat the direction over and over, and not just over and over, but potentially in an escalating way, louder and louder, or more and more frustrated. And that may include warnings about consequences, for example, about losing a privilege if the child doesn't do what we want. While that may end up solving that particular situation, it's not a long-term strategy that we would like to use. And also, it's not much fun for anybody involved. So now, thinking back to the example, how did you respond when they refused? Did it lead to a power struggle? Did you end up having to use a physical prompt of some kind or nagging? At some point, did you give in? At some point, did they just give in? And was there a consequence? For example, they lost iPad time or some other privilege. Think about it for a couple of seconds and if you have paper with you, jot it down. Obviously, we want to try to avoid these kinds of strategies. We need something that will work and that will work in the long term, not just in the moment for those particular situations that we're in. So like what? What are the things that we have available to us to help? Well, we are going to cover some strategies that can help in the moment. But we're also going to look at an approach, a more comprehensive approach that will help increase motivation to follow directions. Let's start with some of those in the moment strategies. One of the first things we need to do when we give an instruction or ask our child to do something is make sure that we have their attention before we ask them to do it. If we don't have our child's attention, then they're not going to hear our instruction, and if they don't hear our instruction, then they're not in a position to follow through on it. We could do an entire workshop on making sure that we can get our child's attention, and we don't really have time for that within the context of this workshop. So for right now, we're going to assume that you have ways that you can go about getting your child's attention. If you have difficulty with your child's attention, that's something to talk with your BCBA about, and the two of you together can work through some strategies and protocols that can be used to help increase that. So, assuming that you have your child's and can get your child's attention, make sure that you have it before you ask them to do something. And then, make sure that you have phrased your instruction as a request and not as a question. Never phrase it as a question unless no is an acceptable answer. For example, in therapy, we might say, time to clean up the toys, not, do you want to clean up your toys? It's really important that we use that very straightforward statement that we tell our child what's expected rather than use a question. Questions are certainly softer and it's very tempting to use them. And they seem more polite. But it's very difficult for children to discriminate when something is a question for real and when it's just a softened request. And we want to make sure that our children also keep a very strong response in being able to say yes or no when they're asked an actual question. 
make sure that the words that you use are understandable to them and you may need to use fewer and simpler words. Again, sometimes we think that it makes our instruction or what we've asked more understandable if we use a lot of words and explain a lot of what we want to do. That may not actually be the case. Sometimes we need to use fewer words or simpler words. It's really important for us to make sure that our child understands the vocabulary that we're using. If they don't, they can't follow through. We might also need to make sure that they're able to follow the number of steps that are required in what we have asked. If we give an instruction that requires doing too many sequential things, they may not be able to do that many in a row. It might be necessary to give fewer directions at a time, taking a break after each one of them and allowing the child to complete that task before moving on and giving the next piece of the direction. And it's also important to make sure that we aren't leaving any gaps in our instructions. It may seem to us very simple, those little small steps that happen in between the things that we need to do. It's not always so obvious to our children. And I'm going to show you a video that gives you a little example of what I mean about that. So here's a dad and a child, and they're doing the, uh, it was actually called the PB and J challenge. And the child is going to describe to the dad how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Step one, get two pieces of bread out. Got him. This get dad is teaching his kid a very valuable lesson, but the way that he does it is hilarious. It Take a look at this funny video. No, dad, with the peanut butter. I'm just doing what it says. It says, take one piece of bread, spread it around with the, bu with the butter knife. Hold on. Get some jelly, rub it on the other half of the bread. No, Dad, open the jelly. Well, it doesn't say to do that. Put the breads together on top of each other. Take a big bite. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. There are several other examples in that video. I'm just going to play that first one for you. And the point is that there are many steps within things that we ask our children to do that seem very obvious to us, but may not be to our children. When our instructions are incomplete, it can lead to confusion, frustration, or to failure, and just simply not following through on the thing that we've asked them to do because they don't know how to go through all of the steps. I had to... The next in the, in the moment strategies I'd like to talk about is that it's okay to tell our children, first do what I ask, and then I will give you something good. With regard to this strategy, however, I want to point out that it's really important that you state this from the very beginning of the thing that, we're at, that you asked them to do. For example, I want you to go clean your room, and after you clean your room, you can get five minutes of video break. That's perfectly okay. We're telling them what the expectation is and what they can expect afterwards. When we don't want to use the first sense strategy is later as a part of that power struggle. Instead of saying something like, um, I want you to go clean your room, child says, no, I don't want to clean my room. I'm not going to clean my room. That power struggle goes on for a few more minutes. And then finally you say, fine, if you clean your room, then you can watch five more minutes of it. Then you can watch, take a five minute video break. That's not what we want to do. That is closer to what we sometimes think of as bribing, right? We've hit a situation in which our child is refusing to do what we want, and now we're adding in, in, some, in the incentive. If we give the incentive from the beginning, that's not a bribe. It's also important at this point not to flip that script and say, fine, you can watch five more minutes of the video, but then I need you to clean your room. That's also a bad strategy because there is no incentive to go back and clean the room after they've gotten their five minutes of video break. 
it's also important for us to consider what else is happening when we ask them to do something. Does what we, we ask require some sort of transition? Are we interrupting something that they like to do? If those things are true, we might need to take a slightly different approach to how we're asking them to do something. If your child does have difficulties with transitions or with interrupting things that they like to do, especially when they're preferred activities, that's something that you might want to talk with your BCBA about to see if you can come up with a more comprehensive protocol and strategies for changing that behavior and making that more smooth, a more smooth transition. It's always important, and this wouldn't be a workshop in behavior analysis, in applied behavior analysis, if I didn't tell you that we should be rewarding our children for doing the things that we would like them to do. Don't forget to let your child know when you appreciate their instruction following. Do that with praise or with the access to the then item if you did state it as an if-then statement. Do it often in the beginning, but continue to do it periodically and randomly and unpredictably even after they have a good instruction following repertoire. All right, so how about try this? Make sure you get their attention. Then ask them to do what you'd like them to do. Remember to state that in terms of an actual statement, not in a question. And then wait. Give them time to do it. If there is no response, if they don't follow through, then ask yourself, is this a situation in which they can't do it because they don't understand what I've asked? I haven't actually gotten their attention. There are too many steps and so forth. Or is this a situation in which they won't do it because the motivation to do so is lacking? If it's a can't situation, go back and use some of those in the moment strategies. If the direction is followed, then be sure to provide a reward. And what about when that motivation is lacking? Well, what do we do? In those cases, you may need to follow through some prompting and some other um, you may require in that moment a little bit of physical prompting, a little bit more um, strategic prompting to get them through. You can ask them things like, is there something I can do to help you through this? Or you could ask, um, what kinds of things can we do to get through this together? The point is, we need to make sure that we do eventually get some follow through on it before we move on. Let's take a look at this friend and see how she does with following directions. As you watch the video, pay attention to the kinds of things that her mom asks her to do, how she responds, and what her mom's response is. Can you do the balance beam? Come to mom. Alexandra, you really are a very badly behaved child. No, that's Miss Andrea. Andrea. Miss Andrea. Okay, are you going to do a big jump? Okay, you're waving, I know. Now do a big jump. No. Yeah, she wants you to, do a, to go on the balance beam. Okay, do a somersault coming down. No, you're going to hurt yourself. You know what? You are going to hurt yourself. Alexandra, I'm, no, I keep saying you don't go that direction. You come down, right. Now do a somersault. You are going to hurt yourself. So, based on that video, what are some things that mom could have done differently? Well, uh, when I've done this workshop in person, some of the things that people have suggested are one, she could put down her phone and go over and stop filming that and, and go and help the child through that situation. But notice that she has um, repeated instructions very frequently. She hasn't set up any kind of situation where she can tell whether or not the child is actually attending to and um, comprehending what she's asking. It may have been a little bit difficult to see, but I believe that aqua mat had an incline on it. So when she was telling her child to go down, what she meant was to come towards the camera. 
but to the child to say to go down, well, did her child actually understand what those things meant? It's also unclear whether or not there was any motivation to follow through, and it probably is the case that there was a mixture of things going on, that she was having some fo difficulty following based on comprehension, but that she was also lacking in motivation. That lacking in motivation is what we call the won't. And what can we do to decrease the won't? and increase motivation to follow directions and the things that we ask our children to do. Well, the seven steps approach is based on the idea that we should control our child's environment and not our child. And by doing that, we can find ways to increase their following our instructions. Let me play a video for you that is, um, was recorded by Robert Schramm as part of his workshops. And it shows a father working with his child and controlling the child's environment, in this case, the child's toy, in order to get the child to follow his instructions. Yeah. If he wants to get up, he should be allowed to get up, but then you just take the toy back and say, oh, you can leave, okay. but the toy stays with me, so what do you want to do? Right. And then when he chooses to sit back down, now he's made the choice. Okay, take the toy, okay. Now tell him if you want to play, you have to sit. Sit down, sit, sit, sit. Yeah, good, good job. Good now job. you can play. Yeah. You see, now he's not going to be pulling away from you the whole time. Yeah. Now he's made the choice to sit because you, you restricted the reinforcement. Does that make sense? Yeah. The last thing I want you guys doing is pulling him in. Yeah. Let's see if he tries it again. Yeah. Okay, take the toy back again. Okay, you can get up if you want. Oh, you want to stay? Stay? Oh, good. Good job. Gee. Yeah, he's clapping because he... Uh, oh. Sorry. Sit, sit. It's okay. We can take the handle the tantrum. Good. The rule is, if you want to play with this toy, you play with Daddy. Um, if you want to go by yourself and play, then you can, but you can't take the toy with you. It's that simple. And instead of manipulating him... We just manipulate the toy so that he decides to stay. No. That was a good one. He's, sorry. You can say, if you want to play, you have to sit here. Come here, come here. Sit down, sit down. Proud, sit down. Okay, we'll just sit and wait. Everything else should be restricted. Take the. the come, sit down, sit here. Sit here, sit here. It's okay. Okay. Have him sit. Sit down. Sit. Sit. Sit down. Sit down. Good job. Good job. Yeah. Good. Good. That's good. Now you can move yourself around him a little closer. Uh -huh. Good job. Good job. See, there's no reason to cry. You can play. You just play good. with me. Yeah. It's okay. Gee. Yeah. See. Here's another example. This one is from therapy, and it's an example of a situation where we're not doing a very good job of helping our child learn to listen. This is a video of forced prompting and what not to do to gain instructional control. Ooh, an airplane. Uh-oh, I lost my guy. Ooh, this looks like Humpty Dumpty. Humpty Dumpty sat on a rock. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. Good job. 
You notice in that example, the therapist was using things like physical prompting in order to get the, the quote unquote child in this uh, simulated situation to follow through on what she's been asked to do. The therapist didn't, however, use any manipulation of the environment, the child's environment using the things that the child was interested in or wanted to do. And that's really the crux of the seven steps approach. I wanna point out actually, as we go into the seven steps approach that they're not really sequential steps, they are um, components. So um, as we go through, please don't think that you need to follow them in a part, that particular order. They're sort of all going on at the same time. They have, were developed to improve instructional control, which is a term that we use in school and in therapy to refer to following our instructions. We do that in order to improve the learning of new skills because we want the children to listen to and follow the instructions that we're giving them as part of learning, but also more generally for following instructions and doing things that they don't want to do. The seven steps approach is a process. It's not a one and done kind of a situation. Um, the kinds of steps that we're gonna talk about in a few minutes are really I'm going to focus a lot on how we begin to develop instructional control and how we begin to get our children to listen to our instructions more regularly. But many of the things, and we will, I will point them out as we go along, are important for maintaining that as well. Like most things, it does mean some upfront effort. And I understand that that can also be very difficult given the other constraints and requirements on our time. As a result, as we go through, I also try to point out what are the, some more of the important and critical pieces of the seven-step approach so that you can implement those. So the basic idea is that we want to arrange the environment so that our child wants to do what we ask because they need us to get the things that they want. After your child does what you ask, then they get the things that they want from you. You're controlling their access to preferred items. I wanna point out that while we are controlling their access to things that they like, we're not denying them access to the things that they like. They will always have the opportunity to gain that access and engage with their preferred activities and items and things. They just have to earn the opportunity to do so. The other important piece of the step, seven step approach is that when we give a direction, we wanna ignore everything other than their direction following. And there are some limitations to that, which we'll talk about later, because obviously there are situations in which we need to maintain safety. Um, but oh, as a general rule, what we want to do is create a contrast in which doing what they've asked, doing what we've asked, results in awesome, positive access to things that they really like and not doing what we ask. One, doesn't result in access to those rewards, but also doesn't get any other kind of reaction from us either. All right, so here are the seven steps. The first of them is to show your child that you are in control of the things that they want and that you will decide if and when and for how long they can have them. You need to make sure that you are the one who is allowing access and that your child knows that they have to go through you in order to get that. You're gonna make that easy for them to get it, all they have to do is the things that you've asked them to do. I all wanna point out at this point that we don't want to restrict everything in our child's environment all the time. And as we talk about this a little further on, we'll also talk about how we don't want to have to set up a situation where we're having that level of control every time we ask our child to do something. But in the beginning, when we're first working on really repairing or teaching for the first time the instruction following, we may need to have a little bit more control of the things that are in the environment. Step two is to show our children that we're fun. Make 
interactions that we have together, enjoyable experiences, so that they'll want to follow our directions. And one of the things that they could get as a result of that is to earn more time sharing those experiences with you. Obviously, again, we can't always drop everything and engage in positive interactions and fun times every time our fo child follows um, some direction that we give them. But we are and should be very potent rewards for our children and sharing time and experiences with us is almost always going to be a positive, going to be a reward for our children. Part of how that develops is through the process that we in therapy call pairing. That involves connecting ourselves to the things that the child likes, playing with the child the way that they want to, and with what they want to do, not taking things away from the child in order to connect ourselves with the toy, because then from the child's perspective, we're taking away something that they like, and not giving many instructions during those kinds of pairing times. Not saying, for example, your turn, or can you find the, show me something that's green, things like that. Those are ways in which we take handle pairing in the therapy situation, but pairing also happens every time you play with your child in a very free and way that the, in which the child is leading the play and um, enjoying the time that they spend with you. Now, of course, as part of play skills, a child has to learn that they cannot always be the one in charge of the play direction. That is a, um, an obviously true statement. But during pairing, we kind of want to let that happen. We want to let them be in control of how we play and what we play and just make it a fun and enjoyable thing for us to do. So here's an example, again, from a therapy situation, a simulated therapy situation, in which the therapist, in this case, is not doing a very good job of pairing because they're presenting too many demands and not playing the way the child would like to and not attending to the child, giving, not giving their child the full attention during the pairing. This is a non-example of pairing and interspersing demands. In this example, the adult is not really going to pair with the child and the demands are at too high of a level. Can you find the fish? All right, nice job. Here you go. Again, the therapist in this situation, and again, this is from therapy, not from a home situation, is presenting demands. It looks like a fairly typical kind of therapy session, but what the therapist isn't doing in that situation is allowing for their presence, their interaction with the child to become something that's reinforcing in and of itself. We need to do that in order for social praise, for saying thank you, for a child wanting to do the things that they, one, wanting to do the things that we've asked because um, generally speaking, we're a very positive part of their life. That's true for therapists, that's true for teachers, and it's also true 
for parents while you're pairing. And I encourage you to set aside some time for that very pure pairing kind of scenario on some kind of regular basis. That doesn't mean you have to do it every day. Doesn't mean you have to do it multiple times per day, um, but or for long periods of time per day. But let your child have some time where you are paired with the really preferred things in their life. Not counting you. You are a preferred thing in their life. But I mean their items, their toys, their videos, things like that. Okay. So pause. Uh, let's list or at least think about three things that our child really likes to do and three things that our child really likes to do, that your child really likes to do with you. Those are things, once you've thought through what they are, we can use to help increase instructional control and, and, and instruction following. Okay, take a second. Hopefully, you've thought of a few things that you can use, that you can control within the environment in order to help your child learn to follow instructions. Step three is to show your child that you can be trusted. Always say what you mean and mean with what you say. If you instruct your child to do something, don't allow them access to the reward unless they've complied with your request. Use prompting to help them complete it if you need to, but, but don't give your child access to whatever the reward was going to be if they haven't completed your instruction. Again, we've already talked about that, but it's important to not allow access to those rewards the if then, the thens, um, if they haven't actually done the things we would like them to do. And show your child that following your direction is beneficial and the best way to obtain what they want. When we're first teaching our children to follow our instructions or we're repairing a, a relationship in which they're not following them with any regularity, give your child easy directions as often as possible and then reinforce their decisions to participate and follow your instructions by good experiences. Eventually, you will want to give harder instructions, but in the beginning, in order to first establish that relationship or to reinstate that relationship, you may need to start with very easy things that are things that they can accomplish without much effort or that there um, is some motivation to engage in, and then you can reward that, and that starts to strengthen the relationship and provide consistent reinforcement. In the early stages, you probably will have to reinforce every time they follow your direction. Eventually, you can change that so that you don't reinforce after every good decision, but again, in the beginning, it may be necessary to provide those rewards pretty regularly whenever they follow the instruction and do what you've asked them to do. It's also important to speaking of consistency, to be consistent as possible across people within their life. Within a household, it's really important that um, everyone that they interact with and, give, and, and everyone who provides them with some kinds of requests or instructions are following a very similar approach. Otherwise, what you get is a child doing what one person wants and not at all <laughs> what someone else wants. Kids are smart that way. They can figure out who is going to give in and who they really have to listen and follow their instructions. The sixth step in the pr approach is to demonstrate that you know your pri child's priorities as well as your own. And by that, Robert Schramm means that you show them you know what they like. Again, we just listed out three things that we, our children like and three things that they like to do with us. And it's important to know what kinds of things your child does like. 
I can remember vividly watching a lot of Power Rangers videos with my son and Powerpuff Girls with my daughter. Um, not necessarily my choices, but I demonstrated to them that I knew that those were things that were value to them that they preferred and that I was willing to take some time and engage in talking about playing and watching those particular um, television shows and games. It's also, as a side note, important to not make assumptions about what our children like and to assume that the kinds of things that we find or found interesting as a child are the things that they're going to find interesting and enjoyable. We have to actually put a little work in sometimes to find the things that they actually like to do. And the final step is to show our child that ignoring our instructions or choosing inappropriate behavior will not result in the reward. Again, as mentioned previously, we want to show them that the only way to get access to the thing that we've told them they will get access to is by actually following through on what we've asked them to do. So let's take a look at what it looks like in this simulated therapy situation. And then we're going to take another look at a different example that's occurring in a home setting. Should we go look at that stuff? Nice job. <laughs> Notice that the therapist in that situation was controlling the environment, controlling the toys that the child liked to play with, and was making the child play with those toys in the desired area of the room or only allowing access to them after the child followed the instructions. Let's take another example. This one that um, is occurring in a home setting. This was recorded by Robert Schramm. Um, he does a lot of work in Germany, so the video is in German. However, it is um, subtitled, so you should be able to follow along with the subtitles. And frankly, there are some portions of it that you don't need to read in order to tell what's going on.
Yeah, give him some water. Yeah, I'll take you up. Und 
note that in that video, they were, they were able to wait out that tantrum, and that was something that they just continued on doing what they were doing. They had conversation. They let him go ahead and have his tantrum, and they wait that, waited that out. Before we move on, I'd like to take just a moment to think through what are you see some of the challenges that you might have to using the seven steps approach. Again, I recognize that it can be very difficult to implement all seven steps within our daily lives. I would encourage you, however, to use the idea that you can control your child's environment that, and use the, um, their access to preferred items, activities, and um, videos, and other things that they like um, as a reward for following your instructions. The, it's usually only necessary to do that after every example or most example or most examples of their instruction following in the beginning when you're first doing the process and when they're first learning how to follow your instructions and do the things that you've asked and that eventually you can fade that out but yes it does sometimes take a little bit of um, extra effort in the beginning in order to establish that I also want to really highlight that it's important to not give them access to the things that you've promised if they don't follow through. Now, while the, in the video they were able to ignore that tantrum, there are some things that do require more attention that it's not necessarily possible to ignore. Those might include self-stimulatory behaviors, destructive, aggressive, or self-injurious behaviors. If those things happen occasionally as a result of instruction following or being asked to do something, you might want to go back and analyze whether or not you've asked them to do something that they can do. Some of those things can occur because of frustration. Um, when you are not able to follow the instruction. However, if they happen with more regularity, one of the first things you need to do in any situation, of course, is to make sure that everyone stays safe. But if they are happening with more regularity, then have a conversation with your behavior analyst about that, because that's probably something that we would like to address with more of a team approach in which they're giving you some strategies for what to do at home while they're also systematically working on it during therapy. In most cases, you would like to block the access to engaging in the behavior, whether it's self-stimulatory, destructive, aggressive, or self-injurious, but you may need to engage in other strategies. Again, I highly recommend that you talk with your behavior analyst about what those strategies might be for your individual child. All right, let's take a look at one final video. I include this one because one of the things that it shows us is the beginning stages in which they're first developing that instruction following behavior. But it also includes some follow-up clips showing how he behaves as they continue the process. Give him one for sitting if he sits.
Restlichen. Mhm. Ja. Aua! Ja, gut gemacht. Ja. Ja. Schön, da geben wir ein Stöckchen. Das ist die Katze. Wie macht die Katze? Miau. Wie mal ich drauf. Anton, was ist das? Ei, Mach's besser, Anton. Was ist das? Ei, Das ist der Löwe. Wie macht der Löwe? Ah, prima. Leg drauf. Nein. Prima. Anton, was ist das? Das ist ein Wie macht das Pferdchen? Prima, Anton, fein. Was ist das? Ein Schmetterling. Prima. Geh drauf. Oh, zeig dir Klatschen. So. Möchtest du Flips an? Ja. Zeig mir Klatschen. Wo ist deine Nase? Wo ist deine Nase? Prima. Wo ist dein Bauch? Hinter dem Bauch. Wo sind Mamas Augen? Wo ist Mamas Augen? Prima. Ja. Was mag das? Möchtest du ein oder drei Flips? Drei Flips. Bitte schön. Und dann dreh dich. Zeig mir hüpfen. Zeig mir hüpfen. Prima. Mach das. Mach das. Zeig mir Nadines Ohren. Wie ist dein Nadines Ohren? Wo sind Nadines Ohren? Wie ist dein Nadines Ohren? Da sind Nadines Ohren. Möchtest du ein Flip? Ja. Bitteschön. Zu prima jemand. 
Was macht das Mädchen? Ganz prima. Was macht der Mann? 63. Prima. Und der Junge? Prima. Und was macht der Junge? Junge. Prima. Was macht der Mann? Mann. Was macht der Mann? Mann. Der saugt Staub? Obviously, over the course of several months, he has developed a much stronger instruction following repertoire. And in this case, it's helping him with his instructional time and his learning. But you could also make the assumption that it's, well, he's also doing a better job of following directions that are more naturalistic within his environment. I hope that you were able to take away some important points from today. That, it's, that there are some things that we can de do in the moment to try and help to increase the amount of instruction following that's happening in the moment. And that there's also some approaches that we can engage in, in particular the seven step approach, in order to make a more lasting change. I want to point out here before we leave that while following our instructions and being quote unquote compliant, can be a very important skill. It needs to be balanced with the opportunity to be able to say no and to know when those situations are. We don't ever want to put our children in a position where they automatically comply with every instruction that they've been given and everything they have been asked. That can become very problematic from a perspective of uh, peer pressure and being asked to do things that are inappropriate by both peers and adults. So we want to be sure to balance that. However, the first step is actually teaching and in strengthening when necessary, following the directions and following through on the things that we've asked them to do. If you're interested in some additional resources on the seven-step approach in particular, here are some places you can find additional information. If you have any other questions, feel free to talk with your behavior analyst or to reach out to me via the office, and I will be happy to answer questions that you might have. Thank you so much for taking the time to go through this workshop, and I hope that you learned something and that you have a wonderful rest of your day.